Alrighty. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Um, Patrick, who's trying to hunt down food, asked me to come and speak to you all uh, about Python and hardware and all of that stuff. So uh, we'll get going. And let me know if there's anything you, up here you have questions about or, or can't see, and I can make it better. Um, who am I? I'm Scott Shawcroft. I go by Tan Newt online. It was randomly generated in like 1999, and it happens to be unique. Uh, so it worked out that way. Uh, I'm a freelance software engineer. I work for a company called Adafruit. They do uh, hobby electronics based out in New York. So their business model is pretty straightforward. They sell hardware. Um, but they pay me to work on uh, software for that hardware, a reason for you to buy that hardware uh, full time. I'm a 2009 UW grad. I uh, graduated with a uh, bachelor's in computer engineering. And I went to Google for six years after that in the Fremont office and then left there and then found Adafruit. So I've been at Adafruit for three years and basically started um, what has become CircuitPython. So um, this is the plan for today. Um, I'm gonna do two demos, one at the start and one at the end. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a CircuitPython demo so I can show you what that means. And then we'll go through uh, a goal that we want to do with a Game Boy, and we'll talk about all the different layers to make that happen, and then we'll actually do the Game Boy demo at the end. Um, so hopefully that all works. Um, first, I want to show you CircuitPython. So we're actually going to jump out of the slides, slides here. Um, this is one of the boards that Adafruit sells. This is our new uh, Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. Um, it's a $25 board. It's got a bunch of sensors, a bunch of lights, and uh, it's running CircuitPython. So, um, CircuitPython is just like regular Python. If you program Python, it'll look very familiar to you. Um, the way that works is you just plug in a device that has CircuitPython installed, and you can see it changed all of the lights to green here. And if we go into Finder, it also showed up as a CircuitPy drive. And on the CircuitPy drive, there's a code.py file. Now, this is a special file name that the CircuitPython mechanics will look for and automatically run when the device starts. So even before, if I had a separate battery, it would run that code even if it wasn't plugged into a computer. It, it is a computer in and of itself. Um, what I can do is I can just double click on code.py and bring up Atom, which is one of my uh, preferred code editors. And you can see uh, we have six total lines with a blank, blank line for five lines of code here. Um, we have two different imports. Um, board is just giving us board specific names that we can use and then NeoPixel is the kind of branding we have for these LEDs around the outside. They're RGB so you can basically make any color you want. Um, this is just telling it, oh we have 10 of them and I'm, I can now set the brightness um, or the color. So if I just say brightness 1, I'm not going to look at it because it's going to blast eyes out. But it should be super quick. All I did was I, I hit control S. Uh, to save and then it automatically reruns. So the device detects when a file uh, is edited on the drive and then it restarts all of the Python mechanics. Um, so we can switch that back to point one and uh, we can also tweak like the colors. So there, now we have yellow. We could do like a tinted white, um, just like that. So. The whole goal with CircuitPython is to make it really, really easy to get programming hardware, um, like we've done there. So uh, that's the first demo. Let's go on and talk about what CircuitPython is. Now, before I forget, let me eject just to make sure my file system stays happy. Um, and go back to the slides. So we think of CircuitPython in two parts. First is the code itself, and then we also think of the community around it. So uh, it's really handy to have that vision as a person who leads an open source project because you spend your time working on both of these things. If you think of your role as a project maintainer to just be code, you're going to be really unhappy because if you're successful, you will have a community whether you like it or not. Um, and it's important to realize that you should spend time uh, on that community. So the first part, um, I've said this a little bit already, but the first bullet point is Python's really easy to iterate on. And that in and of itself is super powerful. 
Uh, so we're taking that ease, ease of iteration and uh, experimentation, we're bringing it to uh, hardware platforms. Um, and as I showed you, uh, the tool chain itself runs all on the device and that makes it really hackable. It means that we, it's kind of a known quantity what tool chain you're using because it's running on the device itself. All I was doing when I was plugged in was saving a text file to the device and then the device does everything else for me. I'll have to worry about, do I have Python? Like, you don't even need Python installed on your computer. Like, it's, it's completely separate. Um, here's a link to the GitHub if you do want to check out the code. It's all MIT licensed, um, so everybody is welcome to check it out and work on it and hack it and fork it and all that. Um, and it's also important to note that we're not the kind of originators of this idea. We're based on a project called MicroPython that kind of dates us two, two more years um, Damien George is the creator of that, and he was the first person to be like, look, I can take a small computer like a microcontroller, like this one runs at, at 64 megahertz, and I can actually run Python on it. There's no OS, it's just my parse, compile, uh, run VM stuff. Uh, and, and MicroPython did the hard work to make it feel like Python 3. So they did a great job and continue to. Um, on the community side, um, this is something where we kind of decided to be a separate CircuitPython community. Uh, one thing was we had a we have a code of conduct and we actually enforce it. Um, so we we get a lot of people coming into our community because they know they could be hit themselves and they know that they're not going to have to deal with a bunch of uh, garbage people. <laughs> uh, we don't tolerate tolerate those folks. Um, where that community lives is both on our Discord chat and uh, on GitHub is primarily where you see. And then we also have a huge swath of libraries. I, when I update these slides, I always have to increase these numbers because we're just growing like a weed. Um, we have 190 plus different libraries. So these are pure Python libraries that can help you support this temperature sensor or that display or um, Bluetooth stuff, for example. Um, and then we also have 80 plus supported boards. So boards are um, this chip on, in this form factor or this chip in a different form factor. Those are different boards. And they're also uh, can be manufactured by di different manufacturers as well. It's not just Adafruit boards on there. Um, this is a slightly old uh, screenshot of our downloads page. So if you go to circuitpython.org slash downloads, you'll get a, a listing of all of the boards that we currently support um, or have supported in the past with CircuitPython. Um, and that's where I got that 80 plus number. It's from there. Um, this is one thing I wanted to add support for, though. These are Game Boys. Uh, they were the for this left one, the gray one, is called the dot matrix grid. It's a serial number DMG, and it came out in 1989. Um, I have a fondness for these devices, and uh, being able to program them is really hard because they have a custom CPU that has custom instructions, and uh, somebody has created, created a compiler for it, but you also need a separate cartridge and all that stuff. Uh, so it's, it's very specialized tooling. And I, uh, what I wanted to get away, I wanted to get away from that. Um, so this is the insides of the Game Boys. Uh, these are the same three. So DMG, the original, the middle is a Game Boy Pocket, which is a smaller, simplified version, but equivalent. And then on the right is a Game Boy Color. Um, the big black plastic in the middle is the cartridge connector. So when you sit a Game Boy cartridge in, um, it connects to there. And then the middle chip, it's actually labeled CPU. It's basically where all the logic is. Um, the only other chips that you see there are like RAM chips or can be like audio amplification. Um, the CPU kind of has everything on board. It needs to be able to do both the display and sound and button processing and all that. Um, so this is what carts look like. On the left, we have Tetris, and it's the very simplest kind of form of a cart. It's just memory. So it's 16 address lines that say what byte you want to read, and then eight, line address line, or eight data lines coming out actually reading the data off the cartridge. There's no saving. There's no nothing. It's just playing the game from the same place every time you start up. Um, in the middle, we have Mary-Kate and Ashley's Pocket Planner. 
um, which was a game. Uh, huh? What a classic, I know. Um, so as you can see, I've like cut the cartridge apart, and that's because, because I need to put my cartridge in something. And so I go to the store and I say, give me the cheapest game you possibly can. And Mary Kate and Ashley's Pocket Planner, hello, uh, happened to be one of the cheaper uh, games I could get for the Game Boy Color. It's actually uh, black because uh, that means that it has both co Game Boy Color and regular Game Boy support. Um, if it's if it's uh, the gray, that means it's only black and white, and if it's only like semi-transparent um, black, that means it's Game Boy Color only. Um, but on the cartridge, you can see there's a lot more to it. There's uh, four chips on here. Uh, the top right round thing is a battery. So the way you do saves in 1989 or ni early 90s is uh, they don't have flash like an SD card is. That technology didn't exist. So they basically took RAM and then they had a battery attached to it. So your RAM just never wiped. Um, and I always like to warn people, if you played Pokemon as a kid and have save states, make sure you back them up because if you let the battery die, you will lose those saves. Um, so look online if you do have things that you actually want to save. And you can um, back them up and you can also swap the batteries out. So if you go to like Pink Gorilla in the U District, you'll see that they say like, oh, new save battery, new save battery. That means they've swapped that out. Um, and then these cartridges also have, uh, they have RAM for saves and then they can also have a, a memory bank controller which allows the 16-bit address line to actually uh, read more memory than 16 bits can on its own. Basically, there's a special area that you say, like, do this, and then that will swap the bank. Um, that's good for more graphics or, or more uh, sound stuff. So on the right is a Game Boy cartridge that I designed. Um, and it's a, well, a whole lot more complicated. As you can see, it's, it's basically, a lot of the same circuitry as this circuit playground, but its job is now to pretend that it's memory, even though it's not. Um, and then I also added MIDI in and out because people want to make 8-bit tunes and stuff. So I added that on there as well. Um, but yeah, basically the goal is to have CircuitPython act like memory to the Game Boy. And that should give us access to basically everything on the Game Boy and allow us to program in Python to be able to do whatever we want. Um, so here's a bit bigger of an image of the same cart. Uh, this, using a microcontroller as a cartridge is not a new idea. Somebody else had actually done it and I found it online. Um, there's actually one trick that's really cool that you can do. Well, I think it's cool. Um, but you know, if you turn a Game Boy on and it scrolls Nintendo down, uh, you can actually change that so it says something else. Um, but you can only do it with a microcontroller because it, it, has, it reads Nintendo from the cartridge to validate that it's actually a Nintendo cartridge, but it also reads it to display it a second time. So you say Nintendo the first time, and then you say the bits that you care about, that you want to show the second time, uh, which is pretty neat. And the, the basic principle of the challenge is you're trying to act like memory that's accessed at a one megahertz rate. So, um, if you have data to respond to the, to the uh, Game Boy with, you have to respond at a one megahertz rate, um, which can be a bit challenging because the SAMD51, which is the microcontroller we have on this cart, it runs at 120 megahertz. So we basically have 120 cycles to decide what to give it. And we can talk, we'll talk a little bit about how that is done. So this is kind of the goal. Um, this is the Python code that we'd like to do. We want to have a library that has an object called Game Boy, and then we want to be able to address just basically any memory address on the Game Boy and set the values for it. So uh, this demo is setting uh, a particular bit in a particular register. So registers are uh, kind of like shared memory space between something that does the, the CPU and something that does something specific. So in this case, it's the electronic bits on the chip that produce the sound. So it, you can think of the registers as the API between the CPU and the electronics that are doing something special. Um, so there's an 8-bit eight, eight register uh, at FF14, which 
does a number of things. It sets the high frequency bits. It says something about, I, I don't remember what continuous is, <laughs> but if you set start to one, it will play the sound. Um, so our goal, our task, if we choose to accept it, is to set that bit so that we can play a sound. And then we'll, at the end, we'll get a little bit fancier and play with how we can change the sound over time too. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of do the deep dive. We're going to start at Python land, and we're going to go all the way down through C, all the way down to what's on the wire when we do it. So assembly instructions to the Game Boy CPU. So uh, this is the same demo. I just factored out the offset uh, because there's four voices. Voices are like concurrent sound wave generators that can happen on the Game Boy. Um, and they get mixed. So I just factored out like where the registers start for that. That's why it's offset. So what we're going to look at is this last line, uh, which is doing the kind of assignment of data to a particular address on the Game Boy. Um, so the first layer that we get is just pure Python code that's taking the lower levels of Python and making it kind of more Pythonic and easier to use. Um, Python has a set item. Uh, it's kind of special method that you can implement on an object that kind of like implements when you do brackets. Um, so that's what this is doing. We're giving index, which is actually going to be our address, and then the value is, that, is the value that we're going to write out to it. You can see that we're taking, we have an array of kind of instructions, and we're kind of patch, we're patching the data into that array of bytes. And then we're going to queue the command. So we just tell the lower level, like, here's five bytes, clock those out to the Game Boy, and the Game Boy will do something. Um, so these are the kind of the Z80, uh, which is the CPU on the Game Boy instructions. Uh, first thing is the, game, the CPU has registers, which are like really cheap to access memory. Um, they label them with letters. So the first instruction we're going to do is load one value in the C, then we're going to load, uh, which is the 14 of the address, and then we're going to load uh, the value we're going to write to that address at A, and then we do a final instruction that says load from there to there, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we call Q command. So this is where we go down a layer. Q commands itself is actually implemented in C. So here's how you get from Python land into C land. The gist is that it's all structs. Um, you say, oh, this Python object is a struct. Um, all of the structs that represent Python objects, the first attribute or the first field is always uh, the type of the object. So it's basically a pointer to another struct that is the type. Um, and then there's also a, uh, the second thing here, the globals, is a pointer to a table, which is a dictionary. If you've done Python before, you kind of know it's dictionaries kind of all the way down. Um, when you have a flexible language where you can add names, it's very convenient to store all those names, that, the name mapping in a dictionary that you can mutate. Um, so we have three items here. There's a few more actually in the real implementation. Uh, the Q string stuff is a way for us to kind of like uh, intern strings to reduce their duplication. Um, you don't need to know much about that. Um, and Q commands is the thing that we called earlier. So there's, there's that entry. And now we're going to jump to uh, how Q commands itself is implemented. Uh, first, we have this macro. And this macro is just wrapping a function pointer in another struct, because everything's a struct. The macro just says like what type it is. <laughs> uh, we got lots of structs. Um, and then this is the implementation. I came up with this slash slash bar kind of notation. It allows us to put Python style documentation in our C source. So it's restructured text, and we basically strip out any comments that are hash or slash slash bar. And then we just treat it as restructured text. So if you go to our read the docs, you'll see Python-like documentation, even though it's actually implemented in C. Um, and then this is our, the top level of the C layer is really just doing a translation between all of those Python struct objects into real like C types. So you can see we're doing uh, we're doing some validation on the buffer that we got in, right? Like Python doesn't really do type checking, so you have to do it kind of when you need to. Um, so we do that first. And then, um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and then once we validate it and we've kind of, this 
the helper here to get buffer will produce both a, point, a pointer and the length. Um, and we pass that down again into Q commands. We kind of call it the same thing all the way through. But we have this common how prefix that says, like, this is the C boundary between uh, the thing that converts from Python to C into the actual C. Um, so now we're at the lowest level of C. This is where folks who have done microcontroller programming before have probably, probably feel more comfortable. Uh, I do this talk for a lot of hardware folks, and they're not really Python folks. So they're like, OK, th this is meant to make them feel like they know a little bit more about what we're doing. So here you can see that it's a, a straight up kind of C style function call where it just takes a, a pointer and a length uh, for the array. Um, also, we, I put the file name in the comment here. Uh, it, this lower lowest level is a level that can actually be uh, there can be multiple implementations of the same function uh, in our CircuitPython source because different microcontrollers may implement the same thing in different ways. So that Python to C layer, it's shared, which means all of our APIs are identical across different devices that you would use CircuitPython on. But the lowest level here is can actually be different um, anyway. So that's why we have atmail samd, which is like the microcontroller family. And common how kind of tells you that it's one of those things that like will be implemented differently. Um, and I, I stripped some stuff out here, but the general idea is that um, we're using a thing called DMA to be able to keep up the data rate at a one megahertz. DMA is really cool if you've never heard of it. It's called direct memory access, I think. It basically t offloads the task of um, moving a byte from here to here from the CPU, so you don't have to spend that time in the CPU itself. You can have a separate piece of hardware that just says every time something happens, copy from here to here. And then the CPU doesn't need to worry about it. You can do something else. Um, so the way that, oh, I added a new slide to a different version. I forgot to copy it here. Uh, but the way that it works on the Game Boy is the Game Boy has a clock. It's a one megahertz clock. And we basically say every time that clock falls, along with the fact that it's reading from us, we'll do that DMA and copy a byte over. That's what we're looking at here and what's driving our DMA. OK, so that's Sealand. Do you have any questions? Since we have a small group and we have a lot of time, we can pause, let it soak in. So the DMA, is it, it's not, you don't have like an intermediate buffer that you're writing to that so the Game Boy will like give you that buffer. Instead, you're just waiting for the Game Boy to go to C, you know, summit address, or the. Right, so uh, the question is that whether we have an intermediate buffer that the Game Boy, that we're sharing with the Game Boy. And the answer is no. Um, basically, because we're issuing the instructions to the Game Boy also, we know exactly when it's going to request, like, give me another instruction from the cartridge. Um, and because of that, we actually can largely ignore the address. We don't actually care what address it's going to, except in, like, two cases, which make it a little bit trickier. Um, but basically, you, you busy wait with the Game Boy just reading the same address over and over and over. And then when we call Q commands, we, we have it read in that area. Now, if there's caching or something, we would have a problem, but there's no caching. Like, carts are fast, memory is fast um, in this case, so we don't have to worry about that. We can, we can return different bytes for the same address, and the Game Boy CPU is none the wiser, um, which is really nice. And partly why I like, like electronics of this era is that they're very simple. <laughs> you don't have a lot to contend with at this point. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's keep going. OK, so for the wire, um, I, didn't, I, I showed this picture rotated 90 degrees, but this is the way that you can read the silk screen, which are the labels. Uh, and you can see that there's a whole bunch of A pins. So these gold uh, contacts on the left, what happens is you insert the cartridge into the Game Boy, and it has little springs that come down on those and make electrical contacts. So they're wires for all purposes. Uh, and you can see there's 16 A's and there's 8 D's, and those are the core kind of API between cart and Game Boy. 
A's are address lines, D's are data lines. There's also reset, um, read, write, clock, and power. So we don't have to worry about powering the cart ourselves. We just get that straight from the Game Boy. Um, so let's talk about timing diagrams. Um, <laughs> timing diagrams are a way to describe what happens over wires over time. So our x-axis here is time. And then uh, each, we have three things we're interested in, what we talked about, clock, address, and data. And I just put these brackets to indicate like address is actually 16 wires and data is actually eight wires. Um, I did a little bit of this when I was in school, but I like never really fully appreciated like when I was at Google, we, we would joke like, oh, our job's just moving bytes around. And like, that's actually what computers just do. Like computers is all just about like copying bytes from one place to another um, and doing it, doing it faster than, than we can. Um, so this is what a timing, timing diagram is. And uh, I'm gonna show you a few more. Any well on board? I think we are. Um, so this, we've queued up the DMA via queue commands. We've had, uh, it's a byte array of five bytes. I think it's five, right? Where it's like command, data, command, data, and then command. So load the address, the low part of the address, then load the value, and then store the value into the address. This is the first part. So you can see that the clock drops, and then the data lines get asserted. So it goes this way because um, the data lines are shared. Right? It may not be up to us to always put things on there. Like the RAM, the Game Boy's RAM could, could be putting values to there, or the CPU could be putting values there as well. So uh, you basically uh, don't drive it. You basically don't set a value either way to allow somebody else to set the value. That's why it's in the middle. And then I've also bubbled or colored the bubbles that are commands yellow. Um, so zero E happens to be the Z80 instruction for loading into register A. Um, and then you can see the address increments when we read the data as well. Um, next up, again, we load the, uh, the address into register C. That's two more cycles. So if we're counting, um, you know, each, it's one megahertz between each drop. Uh, that's the clock rate. And then lastly, we store A into that offset, and then we keep going. So that's the wire. Let's do, as the slide says, let's do the demo. Green Game Boy. Uh, this is actually the original, but it's a special edition. I forget why it's green. Um, but uh, I have one of my carts in the back. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'll turn it on, and it scrolls the logo down, makes the chime, and then a third uh, audio playback. So it works, and let's play around with it. So I'm going to do the, the same exact thing I did with the circuit playground, and I'm just going to plug it in. And I will show you, I have a little bit more advanced code than what the slides has, just because it's more fun to make, make different sounds. So the way that I have this working right now is every time I write to the device, it's actually resetting the Game Boy, um, because the cart actually can control the Game Boy, <laughs> which is great. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because if I happen to miss my mark and get shifted when I'm DMA, DMAing stuff out, I don't actually, I no longer know what the Game Boy is doing. And so by resetting every time, I kind of like put myself back into a known state. Um, it's something I'm going to experiment with. Um, but that's why you'll hear the like classic Game Boy chime and then another chime, the chime that we're actually doing after that. Um, so this is the same code as we saw before. You can see offsets here. But now I've added uh, more registers to it um, and kind of added the documentation here to, to talk about what it does. Um, I'll just start at the bottom. And we can change just the frequency. So if we change this, these two ones to zeros, so dropping the frequency, and hit Save. Go again. And it's much lower than it was originally. 
we can put it back and do it again. It's a little slow. Like it, it takes a few seconds just to do the logo drop. So it's higher now. Um, but as you know, if you've ever played a Game Boy, there's a lot of other sounds it can make, not just that. Um, so let's play around with envelope, which controls how long the note actually lasts. Let's just uncomment it and see what it does. So it's a little bit longer, I believe. Um, and we can change the volume. Now it's not actually mic'd in here, so hopefully you can hear it, but let's just, oh, zero is probably not a good idea. But let's see what that does. I heard it, I don't know if you did. It's, it's quite quiet. Um, and it seems kind of like it's shorter too. So let's just, we'll put that back up. Um, and we can make the envelope longer. Let's see what that does. Super long, right? Um, don't worry, it gets even more exciting. Let's see what this one does. So this voice, uh, they're only square waves. Thought that, that was even longer. So the way the audio works is that um, audio is a vibration, moving sound, like compressing and decompressing the air that your ear picks up. And the way that it works, uh, like the speaker cone will actually like move in and out depending on the electrical signal. Um, now, if you have a very smooth tone, you'll have like a sinusoidal wave, but that's actually really hard to generate. So what a Game Boy largely can do is just square. So like one end or the other vibrations and the pitches you get depend on like uh, how f like how frequency, what frequency that happens at. Um, but you can also change um, things over time. So if we uncomment sweep, now what this is gonna do is over the length of that one note we're playing, it may actually change the frequency over time with that. So uh, let's listen to that. <laughs> I just jumped. Um, so that's really neat. And um, let's lower. It wasn't nearly as fun as I've gotten some of the sounds out of here. So let's see what this does. So that's not hard. I, like people, other people have done a lot of work emulating the Game Boy. So. Um, if you've ever played an emulator on your phone or on your computer, people have done the hard work to reverse engineer the Game Boy and most other systems. I actually have a link right here um, that is like a manual that somebody's written for the Game Boy CPU that covers all of the different registers and all of the different bits. The hard part that I had to deal with was like making the cart side and keeping up with the Game Boy and things like that. Um, I think that if we, let's just play around with this a little bit more. Um, I also, the next slide I have also has a really good YouTube video that's about an hour long and it covers everything. <laughs> mm. And let's do one more. I think we have a good frequency. I'm trying to remember exactly what, you can get a little bit, like it's very smooth right now, and you can get it like a little bit chunkier. Oh, that was just really short. Let's have it long still. Um, the other bit here is increase or decrease. So I, one of the previous times I did it, I ended on this one, and it was like super sad. So I'll just... Um, I was like, oh, let's not end on that. That's, that's too sad. Um, initial envelope volume, length of the envelope. I don't remember. Let's see what bit six does. Um, I'm not quite getting the sound that I want. But this will be the last one. 
Hmm? All right, well, that's the demo. Uh, it does work. And uh, now you know how it works, which is super cool, I think. It's definitely the weeds, but um, <laughs> they're fun weeds to be in. So that's the demo. Uh, actually, let me eject so that I don't yank it without forgetting, although it's pretty robust. And let's wrap this up. So here's the Game Boy Talk that kind of got me into this, and I totally recommend if this is interesting to you. And this will trigger a bunch of nostalgia. Uh, but it covers basically all of the bits. So not only does it cover all of the different sound registers and the different sounds that you can make, but it will also cover in great detail exactly how pixels get on the screen, uh, including how the Game Boy Color works as well. So I, it's an hour-long talk, and it's just like super tight and really well done. So um, highly recommend it. Um, if this is interesting to you, uh, if you want to do more hardware, if you want to do more CircuitPython, the place to start is our Discord server. Um, it's adafru.it slash Discord, so adafru.it slash Discord. Um, and we can all, we're always looking for help for folks to join our community, so please reach out if you're interested. Um, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, I go by Tanute on Twitter and GitHub, and tanute.org is my website, that sort of thing. Uh, you can email me. I'm scott at adafruit.com. I'm also scott at tannute.org. Uh, you can find out more about CircuitPython at circuitpython.org. And if you want the presentation slides or the source, um, you can go to github.com slash tannute slash presentations. That's kind of where everything or all of my presentations go. So thank you. And I'm out of slides. Sweet. <laughs> Um, I tend to not do Q&A, so like, if you have questions, feel free to just come on up and we can chat. I have uh, my Adafruit lunchbox full of different hardware things, so if you want to take a look at more hardware, feel free to come on up and hang out. But thanks for coming. 37 minutes.